famous for that. If you have your Bibles, look with me in <clears throat> Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. You're going to have to, forgive me, you're going to have to bear with me uh, the, the heat, the dryness in the building kind of got to my voice a little bit this morning. And uh, so I'm croaking along here. So thank you for your patience with me. And, you know, I'll try not to cough into the microphone, all right? So <laughs> Exodus chapter 19, let's look at verse 1. Let's talk about push the limits. The Bible says on the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, to the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. For the whole earth is mine, so you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back. Now I want you to keep track with me. Moses went up the mountain Talk to God, and now he came back. Now, Moses is in his 80s here, all right? So I just want you to, while we read, I want you to pay attention to how many times he went up and down the mountain, all right? Verse 7, so Moses went back, and he summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words of the Lord. The people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. So that means he went back up the mountain. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and you will put to, and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people said. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people, consecrate them today and tomorrow, have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you don't approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. He said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day and abstain from marital relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire, the smoke billowed up from it like, a, like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses up to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so that they don't force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said, but Lord, the people can't come up the mountain, because you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain, and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come to the Lord, or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Now, very quickly, just jump over to chapter 20 real quick. I want to read two or three verses and we're done. Let's see what happened. Let's read what the rest of the story. Exodus 20, verse 18. Exodus 20, verse 18. It says, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet, and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. And they said to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but don't have God speak to us directly, or we will die. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. 
God has come to test you so that the fear of the Lord will be with you and keep you from sinning. But the people remained at a distance and Moses went up the mountain and approached the thick darkness where God was. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us and your powerful word. Father, I pray we would encounter you this morning. I pray we would hear the voice of the Holy Spirit through your word. If your heart agrees, would you say amen, amen and amen? <clears throat> I have a question from the Holy Spirit this morning. Is it possible that you're living your Christian life right now at a comfortable distance from God? Is it possible that you've settled for a connection with God that is somewhat indirect? You know, you're connected to the community of faith where God is present, where God is moving, but you're not pursuing him yourself directly. You take comfort that you're covered by the prayers of godly parents or godly mentors or your pastor or even a godly spouse but your own prayer life is not up to par. Is it possible that you've settled for staying at a safe distance from him? You stay far enough away that his voice doesn't challenge you directly. You receive his word mediated by a human messenger so that you can disregard anything that might make you uncomfortable or challenge your status quo. Well, that's just the opinion of a man. I don't have to listen to that. Is it possible that you've been avoiding getting close enough to God that you have to surrender your autonomy? You stay just far enough away that you avoid being reminded that he is God and you are not. Harvest time, I have a word from the Lord this morning. Don't pull back from God. Instead, push the limit. Right now we're looking at stories of faith. We've been looking at some of the heroes of the Bible and we've been considering defining moments of faith in their lives. What can we learn from them? What encouragement can we draw from them? You see, as a church family, we've come to our own defining moment of faith. You know, today we're exactly six weeks away from holding our first service in our new sanctuary on Christmas Eve. We're right on the threshold of fulfilling a vision that was born 20 years ago. But we have an urgent challenge in front of us right now. We need about $250,000 cash in order to finish the sanctuary level of the building. We need a little bit more than that to finish the lower level, but our goal right now is to finish the sanctuary and move in and begin using it as soon as we possibly can. And so we're asking you to stand with us right now in earnest prayer. We're asking you to stand with us in sacrificial giving and in faith. You know, when we need faith, the place to go is the word of God. We've looked at the faith of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We've looked at Joseph. Pastor Nick shared with us a defining moment in David's life. Today I want to look at a defining moment in the nation of Israel. But <clears throat> this moment is a little bit different than any of the others that we've looked at. This is actually a negative moment. God brought Israel to a defining moment of faith at the foot of Mount Sinai and they fumbled badly. They faltered in their faith. They blew it. Did you know that everything that is written in the Bible is recorded for our benefit? The stories of the heroes of faith, the Bible says, are written down for our learning. Their struggles, their victories, yes, even their failures are written down to help us. They're written to teach us and encourage us and even warn us. Looking at the children of Israel in Mount, at Mount Sinai this morning, I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit gently calling to us, don't pull back. Instead, push the limit. Looking at this story, I find three reasons to push the limits. And I want to share them with you quickly. 
Three reasons. Don't push the limits. Don't pull back. Three reasons from Mount Sinai. First of all, don't pull back from God, but push the limits to experience his presence. In Exodus 19, Moses is beginning phase two of his ministry. One of my favorite commentators I was reading this week on this passage, and he used those words. This was Moses, phase two of his ministry. God first met Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 3. He spoke to Moses from a burning bush. And in Exodus chapter 3 verse 12, he said, Moses, go bring my people out of Egypt and I will be with you. And this will be the sign that I have sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will bring them to this mountain and you will worship here. So now in Exodus 19, Moses has come full circle. He's come back to Mount Sinai, just as God had said, with over a million people in tow. Phase one of Moses' ministry is finished. His job as Israel's deliverer is now complete, mission accomplished. Now he begins phase two of his ministry, which is to lead the people into a deeper revelation of God. You see, that's why God carried Israel out of Egypt on eagles' wings. In Exodus 19, verse 4, God said, I carried you out to bring you to myself. It wasn't for the sake of freedom itself, but God carried Israel out of Egypt to worship him. God carried Israel out of Egypt to know him more, to experience him more, to love him more, to serve him more. He carried Israel out of Egypt to reveal himself more, to overwhelm them more, to fill them with awe and wonder more, to bless them more. Beloved, I want to tell you something this morning. Our move into phase two is about a whole lot more than just moving into a bigger space. Moving into our new sanctuary is about moving into phase two of our ministry as a congregation. God isn't carrying us into phase two for the sake of more seats alone, although we really do need more seats, but God is carrying us into phase two to give us a deeper revelation of himself there. You know, we've had some wonderful, beautiful, amazing times from the Holy Spirit here in this sanctuary. I thank God for everything he's done, but God has plans to overwhelm us more in phase two. He has plans to fill us with all in wonder more. He has plans for us to grow in him more. He has plans to do signs and wonders more. He has plans to bless us more. He has plans to use us in this community and in this region more. Phase one of our ministry is finished. Mission accomplished. Now it's time for phase two. And this is not the time to pull back from God. This is the time to push the limits and experience more of his presence. God told Moses to prepare the people for two days and then to bring them up to Mount Sinai. He told Moses to mark boundaries all around the foot of the mountain. Moses got that yellow police tape, police line, do not cross. And he strung it all along the, the foot of the mountain. It was a miracle. They had plastic back then in <laughs> B.C. On the morning of the third day, the top of the mountain was covered with a thick cloud and thunder and lightning and a trumpet sounded a long blast and it kept getting louder and louder and louder and it didn't quit. When Denise and I were first married, we were students in Springfield, Missouri. I didn't know it before I moved there, but Springfield, Missouri is a massive rail hub for the whole country. Every freight train traveling from east to west or from north to south passes through Springfield, Missouri, and our student apartment was right on the railroad tracks. <laughs> yeah, we moved here to Greenwich, and 
our first little house was right on the Metro North and 95 was right on the other side of it. And then we moved on up here to right under the runway of the Westchester County Airport. When I retire someday, I want to go to a cornfield in Ohio. It's, it's going to be so quiet, I won't be able to sleep. But our first apartment was, was on the railroad tracks, and all night long, the trains, these massive miles-long freight trains, would pull into the station, and they would sound their horn the whole way. I was used to wake up every night thinking, this is it. The trumpet's blowing. I'm going to be with Jesus. I feel, see if Denise was still next to me in the bed, hoping she didn't go and I got left behind. <laughs> the trumpet sounded louder and louder and louder until the people's knees started knocking together. God said, when you hear that trumpet, come up, approach, come up to the boundary line. Everyone was shaking in his sandals. Even Moses was shaking in his sandals. Exodus doesn't say it, but Deuteronomy tells us, and Hebrew repeats it. God descended on the mountain in fire and in an earthquake and in thick smoke. He spoke to Moses in an audible voice that everyone heard and called Moses up to the top of the mountain. And then God does something very curious. He tells Moses to go back down the mountain and, remind, you know, God could have put in a tram for poor Moses. <laughs> poor guy. He told him to go back down the mountain and remind the people not to cross the boundary line. Moses objected. He said, God, I really don't think you have to worry about it. You already warned us. I put out a marker. And he, trust me, everybody's pretty freaked out down there. I don't think anybody's coming over the line. And Moses was right, because looking over in chapter 20, we find out that rather than crossing the line, the people backed far, far, far away from it. They said, you know what? This is just a little too intense for us. This is just a, a, a little too scary. We, we don't want to talk to God directly. Moses, you talk to him and come back and tell us what he said. But that's not what God wanted for his people. God wanted his people to push the limits. God wanted his people to push forward toward his presence as far as they could go. He, he wanted them to go all the way up to the boundary line. God wanted them to feel the earth tremble. He wanted them to feel the heat of his holy fire. He wanted them to smell the smoke and jump at the thunder. He wanted them to shiver at the sound of the trumpet. He wanted them to hear his own voice. What a contrast between Moses and the children of Israel. The children of Israel pulled back from God. They didn't care to go all the way up to the boundary. That They didn't care to get as close as they might. They preferred instead to stay a comfortable distance away. This was Israel's first national encounter with the presence of God. Up until now, they were glad to bask in his blessings. They were thankful for his supernatural provision. They were thankful for the manna and the water from the rock and the quail. And they were thankful for his protection and his guidance. But God himself was in the background. God himself was removed from them. And they were quite content with that arrangement. Moses, on the other hand, pushed to limits. He was scared too, but in Exodus 19 and 20, he, he climbed up and down that mountain at least four times, and each time, God invited him to climb higher into the cloud of his presence until Moses went all the way to the top. God kept sending him down to check and see if the people had pushed the limit, and each time, God invited him to bring some more people back up with him. As we read on in the book of Exodus, we find that the more time that Moses spent in God's presence, the more he longed for God's presence. After 40 days on top of the mountain in the fiery presence of God, Moses cried out, Now, God, show me your glory. Show me more of you than I've ever seen before. Let me experience you more. Let me know you more. Let me be near to you more. 
as we think about the upcoming phase two of our ministry, I hear the Holy Spirit asking a question, are you like Moses or are you like the children of Israel? Have you pulled back from the boundary line of his presence or are you pushing the limits? Are you pursuing the maximum of God's presence in his life? Are you using every means possible to get near to him or are you satisfied at a comfortable distance? How do we pursue his presence? One way is through the vehicle of daily prayer. One way is through the vehicle of personal prayer in the spirit. If God's given you a heavenly tongue, if he's given you a heavenly language to worship and praise him, you ought to use it every day. Are you pursuing his presence through the vehicle of personal worship, of daily reading his word, through personal study, reading Christian books that help you grow in your faith and help you grow in your understanding of the things of God? Are you pursuing his presence through corporate worship and corporate prayer and receiving the ministry of the word. See, in each one of these things, God's presence is manifest to us a different way. When we worship and we pray on our own in tongues, God's presence is manifest to us in a personally strengthening way. When the congregation is gathered for worship, God's presence is manifest in authority. He is enthroned on the praises of his people. When believers are gathered in fellowship, even if it's just to share a meal, God's presence is there to refresh and to bless. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. God says, there I will release refreshing and I will command my blessing. God's presence is released in a faith-building way while the word is being ministered. In just a few minutes, we're going to come together to the communion table and God's presence, Paul says, is released in a unifying way and his presence is there to heal when the church celebrates communion together. God doesn't want us to stay at a comfortable distance from him. He's checking to see, will we push the limits of his presence? He wants us to experience the thunder and lightning and the earthquake of his mighty power. He wants us to experience the burning fire of his holiness. He wants us to experience the smoke of his transcendence, the heavenly trumpet of his majesty. He wants us to experience the authority in his voice. He wants us to come into his presence to remind us that he is God and we are not. And here's the thing, beloved, the more that we push the limits of his presence, the higher and higher he keeps calling us. Israel didn't even care to go as far as they could, but Moses kept pushing the limits, pushing the limits higher, higher, higher into the presence of God. Push the limits. Three reasons from Mount Sinai. Push the limits to experience his presence. And second, don't pull back from God, but push the limits to become his prized possession it wasn't for the sake of freedom itself that God carried Israel out of Egypt he carried them out to worship him and to be his prized possession God elaborates on that a little bit and it says it means they were called to be a holy nation in the Bible Egypt is a symbol of the world Egypt is a symbol of sinful humanity. It's a symbol of fallen human society without God. It's a symbol of bankrupt values and priorities and morals. God has called us out of Egypt. He's called us to be different. He's called us to have a different pursuit in life, to live by a different set of rules. He's called us to have better outcomes. Moses gives the people some interesting instructions here to prepare to meet the Lord. 
He tells them to prepare for two days, to wash their clothes, and to abstain from marital intimacy. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that married couples are welcome in God's sight to enjoy each other as much as they want, whenever they want. But on this particular occasion, they're told to hold off. It's not because there's anything unholy about marital intimacy, but, but I believe that God was sending a message. God has ownership over our schedules. God has ownership over our possessions. And God has ownership over our bodies. He has the right to tell us what to do and what not to do. Paul captured that in the New Testament when he wrote, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your bodies. The reason that God wanted Israel not to pull back, but to push the limits, is because his presence is absolutely necessary for holiness. You see, his presence makes us reverent. His presence instills the fear of the Lord in us where we revere God more than we fear men, where we want to please God more than we want to be accepted by others. His approval is what we long for, and his presence has a transforming effect on us. Moses kept coming down to see if the people had pushed the limits. When he came down on the, I think, fourth occasion in chapter 20, he saw that, that they had not pushed the limits, but in fact they had backed far away from the line. And he said, no, 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 that's not what God wants for you. God wants for you to stay in his sustained presence. He wants you to hear his sustained voice to keep you from sinning. God wanted them to push the limits so that his presence could affect a character transformation. One has to wonder how differently Israel's story might have played out if only they had pushed the limits rather than backing away. See, those who pull back tend to fall back into old Egyptian ways. Those who pull back tend to fall back into useless old religious traditions. They tend to fall back into carnal appetites. They tend to fall back into old anxieties and fears. They tend to fall back under old limitations. One has to wonder, would they have ever made a golden calf if they hadn't pulled back? Would they have ever had a drunken orgy at the foot of God's holy mountain if they had not pulled back? Would they have been so afraid of the giants in the promised land if they hadn't pulled back? Would that entire generation have died in the wilderness, including Moses, if they hadn't pulled back? In comparison, look at how Moses pushed the limits. When he spent time in the presence of the Lord, his face experienced a physical transformation. The Bible says that when he came away from the presence of the Lord, rays of light shone from his face. Have you ever known some, I want to tell you in, in my childhood and, and through the years of my life, I have known some beautiful, beautiful men and women of the spirit whose faces literally glow, whose faces, their countenances literally shine with a beauty on them because they have spent so much time in the presence of the Lord. But Moses' face, rays of light would come up from it, but then the glory would fade off of his face. So Moses put a veil over his face to keep the people from staring at the spectacle of fading glory. But not only was his face transformed, Moses' character was transformed as well. Seems that our friend Moses had an anger problem. He killed an Egyptian in a fit of anger. He smashed the Ten Commandments, the first set, in a fit of anger. He struck the rock in a fit of anger rather than speaking to it, like God said. And yet God's testimony at the end of Moses' life was that Moses was the meekest man that ever lived. 
So when did this angry man become meek? Well, it happened in the presence of the Lord. When Moses prayed, now, God, show me your glory, he was praying that God would change him permanently, even if it killed Moses. Moses was just as scared as anyone else in Israel. He understood better than anyone else that the presence of God could be deadly. But Moses kept pushing the limits and pushing the limits and pushing the limits. And God kept inviting him higher and higher. And Moses kept staying longer and longer until Moses finally said, God, I don't care if it kills me. Let me behold you until I am permanently changed. No more of this fading glory. Let me see you in your glory so that I am permanently transformed. As we think about the upcoming phase two of our ministry, I hear the Holy Spirit asking, are we like Moses? Or are we like the children of Israel? Is it possible that you've pulled back from him because you're afraid of losing control? And if you've pulled back, is it possible that you've fallen back into some of those old Egyptian ways? Are there any golden calves in your life that you've put ahead of God? Beloved, listen to me. The American dream is really just an Egyptian golden calf. The desire even for that picture-perfect family that you send out on the Christmas card every year, healthy and well-rounded, that can be a golden calf. Your desire for your kid's earthly success can be a golden calf that you put ahead of the Lord. Are we like the children of Israel or like Moses? Are we pushing the limits, pushing the limits, crying out for a transformation into the image of God? God, even if it kills me, I want to see you so that I have no more of this fading glory. I want you to change me for good. God says, I carried you out of Egypt to be my precious possession. The, The word in Hebrew is my royal possession. It's a king's personal wealth. It's not what he controls that belongs to the state, but it's what he owns personally, what is most valuable to him. This word is used in the book of Chronicles when David makes an offering of millions and millions and millions of dollars of silver and gold to build the temple. David didn't build the temple, his son did, but he provided all the funding ahead of time. And the Bible says that he gave it out of his own personal treasure, his royal treasure. It's the same word that's used here in Exodus 19 when God says, you are my royal possession. In our church in Philadelphia, we had a woman who inherited a treasure trove from her sister. After World War I, the the woman's brother-in-law worked for the U.S. government. He was in diplomacy and he was helping in war reparations and he traveled extensively all over Europe and all over Asia. In his downtime, he personally acquired all kinds of antiques and artifacts and works of art and he shipped them home to New York. China and crystal and figurines, Fabergé eggs, paintings, uh, magnificent. The woman from our church inherited, after her sister died, she inherited all of these things. And in a glass cabinet in her dining room, she had the most precious possession of all. It was a set of 50 dinner plates that had belonged to the Romanov family of Russia. All the plates were the same color scheme. They were all a set, but each plate was different. Each one was unique. And on the back of each plate was the mark of the Tsar of Russia. That made them priceless. Can I tell you that's just like us? See, the reason that that God doesn't want us to back away from him and fall back into our old Egyptian ways, the reason he wants us to push the limits in his presence and become holy is because we are his royal possession. We're just like those plates. Each one of us is unique, but we all belong together. We're a set, and all of us have the king's mark on us. 
I carried you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself that you will be my prized possession. Push the limits. Three reasons from Mount Sinai. Push the limits to experience his presence. Push the limits to be his prized possession. And finally this, don't pull back from God. But push the limits to answer your priestly calling. Push the limits to answer your priestly calling. In Exodus 19, we find out that God didn't merely call Israel from the nations. He called Israel for the nations. He called them to be a kingdom of priests for the sake of the rest of the world. In Exodus 19, verse 5, there's something kind of lost in the translation. The, the English translation is not so good. What it says in Hebrew is, you will be for me a kingdom of priests for the whole earth is mine. In other words, God is saying, I want all the nations. I want all the people. I want them all. They all belong to me. They're all precious to me. And so I'm going to use you as my priesthood to reach them. You know, that call to that priestly ministry that was on Israel, do you know that's on the church now? Peter wrote, but you, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, you know, that word peculiar people in the, the, the Greek Old Testament, it's the same word in Exodus 19 when God says, you are my prized possession. It's the same word in Greek that Peter uses when he says, you are a peculiar people. You are God's prized possessions. What do priests do? Priests plead for mercy on behalf of people to God. And they speak to people on behalf of God. And they lead people to God. As Moses pushed the limit and climbed higher and higher up the mountain of God, God was training him for phase two of his ministry. Moses the deliverer was becoming Moses the mediator. I got to tell you what, I think I'm about done building buildings. I've been working on it for 20 years now, and I thank God. Some pastors don't have the privilege of, of ever building any building in their ministry, so I got the privilege of buying land and building one and now building two, but I think I'm good. I, I, I'm done with harvest time. I'm done with harvest time, the builders. I'm looking to be forward to becoming harvest time, the mediators of God's presence. In the presence of God, Moses learned how to become an intercessor and he received the heart of an intercessor. After Israel made a golden calf, Moses stood on the mountain between God and the people. God said, Moses, get out of the way. I'm going to destroy them and I'm going to start over fresh. And Moses cried out as an intercessor and he said, no, God. He said, blot my name out of your book of life. Only spare them. Do you understand what Moses was saying? He was saying, God, I'll be willing. I'll forfeit eternal life if you'll only have mercy on them. I got to tell you the truth. I love y'all, but I don't think I'm quite there. I I'm willing to go through hell for you, but I'm not willing to go to hell for you. Where did Moses get a heart like that? It was in the presence of God. He, his heart became like God's heart, who so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that we wouldn't have to perish but that we could have everlasting life. In the presence of God, Moses learned how to be a spokesman for God. You remember the first time God called him on Mount Sinai, God said, I want you to be my spokesman. Moses said, no, God, I can't speak. So God gave him Aaron. But here in the presence of the Lord, climbing higher and higher into the cloud, he became God's spokesman. He learned how to reveal the character and nature of God to others. He learned how to reveal the will of God to others. And God's will is that all of us in his presence would learn to become his spokesman. There was an incident in the camp of Israel a little after this, 
the Holy Spirit fell on two elders named Eldad and Medad. I'm always sorry there wasn't a third called Yodad. <laughs> Holy Spirit fell on the two elders and they began prophesying. And Joshua became jealous for Moses' sake. He ran to Moses. He said, Moses, tell them to stop prophesying. You're the only prophet here. And Moses said, no, no, Joshua, you don't get it. God would that all his people prophesy. God would that all his people were spokesmen for him. In the presence of the Lord, Moses learned how to lead others closer to God. God kept sending Moses down to check, see if they've pushed the limit, see if they've gone as close as they can. And every time God said, why don't you bring someone, bring Aaron up with you. Why don't you bring Joshua up with you? Why don't you bring the priests up with you? Why don't you bring the young men up with you who offer sacrifices on the mountain of the Lord? In God's presence... Moses taught others how to become priests too. Psalm 103 makes this comparison between Moses and the children of Israel. David wrote, the children of Israel saw God's mighty deeds, but Moses, Moses understood his ways. The children of Israel were witnesses to miracles, but Moses he was a worker of miracles. What was the difference? Israel pulled back and Moses pushed the limits. Beloved, as we think about the upcoming phase two of our ministry, I hear the Holy Spirit asking, are we like the children of Israel or are we like Moses? God doesn't want us to pull back he wants us to push the limit and be his priests. I've called you to be a kingdom of priests for the whole earth is mine. I've called you to be a church full of priests for everyone in Greenwich is mine. Everyone in Stamford is mine. Everyone in Norotan and Rowayton and Darien and New Canaan and Norwalk is mine. Everyone in Purchase is mine. Everyone in Bedford is mine. Everyone in Armonk is mine. Everyone in White Plains is mine. Everyone in New, even Yonkers is mine. Even, e even the Bronx is mine. Even the suburbs of New York is mine. Press into his presence because God wants them all. And so he wants to use us to be his priests. Hear the voice of the Holy Spirit at harvest time. Don't pull back from God, push the limit. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise to you.